All right. Well, good evening, folks. Glad to see you back for evening worship as we close out the Lord's Day together. Trust you had a restful afternoon. Find grace from God's word tonight as you go back into the week and whatever it is God has for you. Let us worship the Lord this evening. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God. And we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Brother Rip will open us in prayer. Lord, we just pray that uh, this COVID continues. We pray that you would keep all the people in this church safe, that no one would be infected. Lord, we pray that this virus will go away. We ask that you would be with our whole country. I just pray for, for all people, young and old, to be protected from the Lord, I pray for those that we do know we do have the virus and we think of Ray Bobo and Wanda. Lord, we ask that you would be with them and bless them during this time. Pray for them through the surgery and I just pray that you would be with them and be gracious and merciful to them and just help them both to recover quickly. Father, we want to continue to remember Jeff Wynn. Jeff suffered a stroke several weeks ago and we just Thank you for the progress that he has made. We just pray that you continue to bless him. And if it be your holy will, you would heal him completely. Lord, we uh, just remember you, uh, McAllister, uh, you, uh, yeah, McAllister, pardon? McAllister, sorry. Uh, please watch over him. Be with uh, Ryan and, and uh, Michelle and, and, and uh, their children, their daughter, during this time as, as you continue his battle with leukemia. Father, we pray for others. We, we ask that you would please be with David Griffin. His mother's very sick. We just ask that you would be with him and comfort him during this time. Lord, we pray that you would. Please watch over uh, me with Richard and his family. Pray that you continue to bless uh, him as he leads this church and our minister. I pray for our elders and deacons. I ask you to watch over them and give them wisdom, uh, give them instruction to lead this church in a way that you please to you. Father, go with us now and I uh, just pray that you be with Richard as he brings his word to us. I ask that you would forgive us of our sins. Yeah. Let me invite you this evening to turn to the book of Hosea, Hosea chapter 1, Old Testament scriptures there, Hosea chapter 1. I do appreciate Rick remembering Jeff went in prayer. His family sent an update and described his condition in more detail. I'll make sure I get that up. Uh, on the bulletin board back there, a letter of thanks to the church for their support and prayers and just explaining more about what they're facing, just conditions all. I'll make sure that gets posted before next Sunday so you can be praying. And then Carolina Pregnancy Center sends their thanks for the donation of diapers, wipes, and other gifts and took over a nice load there. So appreciate the congregation uh, showing support for that. And they are grateful as well. And then the last thing I want to note is Voice of the Martyrs sent us a uh, edition of Fox's Book of Martyrs that they've put out. It's a classic work that a lot of people have read, the, the history of martyrs uh, in the Christian church. Um, that's there in the book room. It's a nice edition they've put out. If any of you want to borrow that, we keep a lot of books back there. You're welcome to, to borrow them at any time. I'll make sure that gets in the library. Hosea chapter 1, then, this evening. Hosea chapter 1, as we return continue our study in these Old Testament books. Let me read verses 1 through 11 of Hosea chapter 1. The word of the Lord that came to Hosea, son of Beeri, during the reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and during the reign of Jeroboam, son of Jehoash, king of Israel. When the Lord began to speak through Hosea, the Lord said to him, Go, Marry a promiscuous woman and have children with her. 
For like an adulterous wife, this land is guilty of unfaithfulness to the Lord. So he married Gomer, daughter of Diblaim, and she conceived and bore him a son. Then the Lord said to Hosea, Call him Jezreel, because I will soon punish the house of Jehu for the massacre at Jezreel, and I will put an end to the kingdom of Israel. And that day I will break Israel's bow in the valley of Jezreel. Gomer conceived again and gave birth to a daughter. Then the Lord said to Hosea, Call her Lo Ruhamah, which means not love. For I will no longer show love to Israel that I should at all forgive them. Yet I will show love to Judah, and I will save them, not by bow, sword, or battle, or by horses or horsemen, but I, the Lord their God, will save them. And after she had weaned Lo Ruhamah, Gomer had another son. Then the Lord said, call him lo Ami, which means not my people. For you are not my people, and I am not your God. Yet the Israelites will be like the sand on the seashore, which cannot be measured or counted. In the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, they will be called children of the living God. The people of Judah and the people of Israel will come together, and they will appoint one leader, and they will come up out of the land, for great will be the day. Jezreel. Amen. We'll end our reading there. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we do thank you for your mercy towards us. Even as we read this opening passage, some of the main ideas very clear the, the sin that separates from us, us from our God, and the mercy that God shows towards sinners. Sin which is an offense to you and, and undeserved and brings with it judgment. And yet you show mercy and restoration. We thank you for that. Thank you for faithful love that you show your people. So as we look at the beginning of this prophet tonight, give us wisdom and understanding, help us to learn, grow in our knowledge of your word, and help us to make application to our lives to obey. To glorify God, to exalt Christ in all of this. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Tonight we come to the 12 minor prophets. We've been doing these surveys of Old Testament books for several months now. We come into one of the last sections of the Old Testament that we haven't looked at, the 12 minor prophets. And there's two things I want to note as we begin them. One is, although we're coming to this section now, we actually have looked at three of these minor prophets. The last three, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. Back when I started this series, I started at the end and did the last three minor prophets, First and Second Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. Thinking back now, I don't know why I did it that way, but I just did. And at some point, we flipped to the front, and now we run almost to the other side. So we're here in the 12 minor prophets, but we'll only do the nine we haven't done. Those older messages are on our website or our church's YouTube channel if you're interested in that. But we'll look just at the ones haven't yet examined. And the second thing I want you to know about the 12 minor prophets, this one's a little more important, is that the Hebrew Bible tends to view these books as a single prophetic work. In other words, we think of them as 12 books in our English Bibles, and, and many Hebrew Bibles do that also in their edition, but they're often called the 12, viewed as one literary unit, almost one book, as, as the canon was gathered, the 12 were viewed as a single prophetic work that unfolded in 12 parts, communicating one message. And the one author who I'm, I've used in this study helpfully, he identifies the message of the 12 as the God who keeps promises. The 12 held together by this infinite emphasis on the faithfulness of God. Now, as we go through them, we'll look at each book one at a time. We'll highlight each prophet's unique contribution. But it's good to remember, ultimately, these 12 compose one message. And as they compose one message, they are expressing really the same ideas as their larger counterparts. The minor prophets come a little later in the Old Testament, and, and they're not perhaps as well known as Isaiah and, and Jeremiah. Maybe they, there's a temptation there to skip them. Uh, in Bible reading, but, but they repay reading, and some of you have studied and then told me about your own studies in the Minor Prophets. And although they're shorter, they have the same message. 
although they are briefer, they are just as important. In fact, don't be fooled by the title Minor Prophets. They're called that only because of their length. Hosea is 14 chapters, Obadiah is only one, as opposed to Isaiah with its 66 chapters in Jeremiah and what have you. They ministered over a, a time span of 300 years. So again, kind of end of the Old Testament, shorter books, but don't think just, you know, backwoods preachers that, that never spoke to the nation. 300 years of faithful ministry from the minor prophets addressing the nation's needs and their relationship with God. And the first that we'll look at on this side of the series is Hosea. Now, what do we know about Hosea? Interestingly, Hosea is the only prophetic book that is specifically addressed to the northern kingdom. Remember the split that took place in Israel, between Israel in the north, Judah in the south, 10 tribes in the north, two in the south. Well, there are other prophets from the north that minister, but only Hosea preaches to the north. This was the prophet that specifically addressed the northern kingdom, Israel. If you look at the opening verse again, it gives us the time stamp for when he ministered. He writes that the word of the Lord came to him during the reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah in Judah, so during those southern kings, and Jeroboam in Israel, the later Jeroboam in Israel's history. So roughly 782 to 753 BC. And if you're wondering, okay, well, give me a give me a point that shows the big deal of that. The northern kingdom destroyed in 722. So he's preaching to the north on the eve of their destruction. One, the prophetic voice that comes only a few decades before they fall to the Assyrian invaders. In other words, he's coming to prevent judgment. He's preaching a message of judgment and yet restoration, calling on the people to repent. Perhaps God will spare them from the judgment that comes. Now, what's best known about Hosea, if you've looked at him at all, you're probably aware of this fact that he's best known for his marriage to an adulterous woman. So he's a preacher, like all the other prophets. He talks about the covenants and unfaithfulness, like the other prophets. He even acts it out like other prophets. Other prophets have signed uh, sermons, so to speak. But only Hosea experienced it personally to this level. He suffers profound personal agony through marital betrayal by his wife. He loves a woman despite her failure to remain faithful to him. And in doing so, he demonstrates for Israel the persevering love of God for a constantly straying Israel. So we'll look at the book this evening with the idea of Hosea demonstrating God's faithful love. And the book divides easily into two sections, chapters 1 through 3 and 4 to 14. We'll begin tonight with chapters 1 through 3. God's faithful love is seen in that God loves an idolatrous and adulterous people. God loves an idolatrous and adulterous people. Once again, verse 2 of the opening chapter, we see that Hosea is commanded to marry a promiscuous woman. When the Lord began to speak through Hosea, the Lord said to him, Go marry a promiscuous woman and have children with her. For like an adulterous wife, this land is guilty of unfaithfulness to the Lord. Here's a big idea you need to know about Hosea. His marriage to this woman, to his wife, will mirror the Lord's relationship with Israel. And both the Old and New Testaments, God's relationship with his people is often likened to that of a marital relationship, the relationship that exists between a husband and wife. And so unfaithfulness to God, breaking his covenant, is often compared to adultery and unfaithfulness. Now, this is a message that this imagery, I should say, of, of marriage is both positive and negative. God speaks of Israel as a young girl that he adopts and loves, as a pure and chaste bride that he both uh, takes her to himself and makes her that in 
uh, his grace. So it's not an imagery that's chosen just to be hard on women. They, they get the brunt of, you know, the negative imagery here. Ladies are used both positively and negatively in scripture as are men. In this book, the focus on Israel's covenant unfaithfulness, though, is likened to this marriage, a marriage that Hosea is told to undertake at God's command and yet results in persistent unfaithfulness. That real life, home situation, painful, will be a picture of God's relationship with Israel. He will act out the sermon in his daily life. Now, here at the beginning, this command to marry an adulterous woman might catch our attention because it seems odd that God would command a prophet to marry a woman engaged in sinful activity. In fact, God forbids priests from doing this. In Leviticus 21.7, God says the priests must not marry women defiled by prostitution or divorced from their husbands because priests are holy to the Lord. So is there a, an issue here, a problem with God commanding Hosea to marry an adulterous woman? And three explanations, three answers to that have been offered. One is to look at the description of her as proleptic, which means she is described in the present as she will be in the future. And we do this all the time. So I met my wife at the Anchorage Christian Camp in 2002. But she wasn't actually my wife when I met her. I met the girl that later became my wife. But the moment I tell that story, I describe her as she later was, so you understand the significance of the story. So when God tells Hosea to marry this woman, she is at that time chaste, but she's going to become unfaithful, and that will demonstrate Israel's falling away. Possible. Here's another idea that when she is described as promiscuous, it is metaphorical. So it's spiritually unfaithful. One author puts it like this. Everyone in Israel was being affected by idolatry in one way or another. Any woman Hosea marries and any children he has will be or will have the potential to be tainted by the ubiquitous idolatry that already taints everyone in northern Israel. So, Hosea, go marry someone who's spiritually unfaithful because everybody in this land is spiritually unfaithful. And you need to know what that's like by being married to her. And then thirdly, some have even said quite specifically this was a cult prostitute. So, someone that was promiscuous by trade even. Uh, one author, again, puts it like this. The noun that's translated prostitute or harlot does not refer to mere adultery, but because it is in the plural... It is an example of the plural of character or plural of repeated behavior. Thus, the phrase wife of harlotries probably refers to a prostitute, possibly a temple prostitute serving at a Baal temple. So a marriage that would get Hosea right in the thick of the idolatrous relationships going on in the land. Looking at those three, I wonder if the cult prostitute explanation might just be a little too specific. In other words, the main argument for it is the meaning of the word or even the fact that the word is in plural. It, it implies repeated behavior. But that could be true of marital adultery, not just specific cult prostitution. And at the same time, when I read of the metaphorical meaning the woman's actions just seem a little too concrete in order to say that it's just metaphorical or spiritual adultery. In fact, that butts up against a more clear command of God, where he says, do not intermarry with those who follow other gods. So you have probably even more of a problem if God is telling him to go marry someone that is uh, spiritually unfaithful. The, the proleptic view that she was originally chased and became unfaithful, that works. But I actually don't think any of these three explanations are necessary because Isaiah is not breaking any clear command of God. The command I quoted you was for priests. It's never directly applied to prophets. And on top of that, it is not unusual for the Lord to break Social convention. Remember what he asked Isaiah to do, to go naked and barefoot for three years? 
Jeremiah's commission to avoid funerals and to forsake marriage. Remember, Ezekiel was told, don't mourn the death of your wife. God put some of these prophets through the ringer, so to speak. And it's just not unlike him to use these men and their lives in a way that breaks social convention. So I wonder if it's quite frankly God telling Hosea, marry this woman of a bad background and she's going to act that way in your marriage. Again, the point isn't, well, you know, she's just not from the right family or she makes a mistake here. This is a person characterized by adultery. Again, a promiscuous woman as the NIV renders it. That image fits Israel's history. And so Hosea goes and he marries her in obedience to God's command. And that will image God's relationship with Israel. Now let's talk about their children. Because once they are married, they begin to have children. And God assigns names to these children that will predict the judgment coming upon Israel because of their covenant and fidelity. So the whole family is enacting God's message. You know, the, the traditional way of talking about pastor's family. You know, they all need to sit together on the front row. They're all in the ministry together. Th this is that way beyond any kind of social convention with pastor's family. The whole family is enacting God's message to Israel. So the first, a child, a son, in verses 4 and 5, God names him Jezreel. And that recalls the location of a great slaughter in Israel's past. So when Jehu is raised up to deliver judgment on Ahab uh, and Jezebel and their house, the, the slaughter took place in the valley of Jezreel. It, it was a name that called to mind judgment. And so it was a name that would signify coming judgment. This judgment that came in the past, it's going to come again and worst. And I would argue those then signal worse and worse judgments until we get to the Bible description of hell. They're always pointing to something much more terrible to come until they point to that ultimate reality. Jezreel, the first child. Then Hosea's wife, Gomer, conceives and gives birth to a daughter. And God commands him to name her Lo Ruhamah, which means not love. God will no longer show love to Israel because of their unfaithfulness. Interestingly, he will show love to Judah. He will postpone their judgment for another 150 years, though it eventually comes on the southern kingdom as well. And then finally, the third child that is born is named Lo Ami, which means not my people, because God will disown Israel. He will give them a bill of divorce. He will no longer acknowledge them as his people. In fact, it may even be that this child, lo Emi, is not even Hosea's son. Remember, this is an adulterous woman, so it may bear fruit here in this third child not being his son. In the New King James, in verse 3, when talking about the first son there, the language is, she bore him. A son, reflecting the Hebrew. She bore a son to him. That language is not used when we get to this third child. And there is also a phrase in the next chapter referring to children born of adultery. It's very possible that this third child is not even Hosea's because of the unfaithfulness of his wife. That is the picture and the wound and the hurt that Hosea feels is to picture Israel's unfaithfulness to God, God's grief at their unfaithfulness, and God's settled determination after much patience, patience, many calls to repentance, to finally divorce his people and disown them. The language here in verse 9 parallels ancient divorce formulas, and so it speaks of divine rejection as predicted in the covenant curse. And anyone who's experienced this or worked with this or seen this knows the hurt. These are real painful situations. And as God says here, that, that Hosea, you've got to know what I'm going through with this nation. And the people have to know how serious this is, how serious is the unfaithfulness, how much it hurts, but how eventually mercy runs out and judgment comes. So the question we have to ask ourselves 
tonight, as we fast in almost all of these prophetic sermons is, is that the final word? Is that where God leaves it? Israel disowned and divorced and no longer God's people know. The reversal begins even here in this chapter in verses 10 through 11, where God says, even though you are not my people and I am not your God, yet, verse 10, the Israelites will be like the sand on the seashore, which cannot be measured or counted. In the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, they will be called children of the living God. The people of Judah and the people of Israel will come together. They will appoint one leader and will come up out of the land, for great will be the day of Jezreel. In other words, this divorce, this disownment is only temporary. Only for a short season will I put my people away from me. And eventually, those who are called not my people will be called my people. Chapter 2, verse 1, say of your brothers, my people and of your sisters, my loved one. I will adopt them again. I will marry them again, mixing the metaphors. I will restore them to myself and restore them as covenant people enjoying covenant blessings. Now, a question we might ask is, okay, well, when does this take place? And how does it take place? Let me read you words from Paul's letter to the Romans. You can note the reference, Romans 9, and listen to verses 22 through 26. And listen to the voice, listen for the voice, the words of Hosea. Paul writes, what if God, although choosing to show his wrath and make his power known, bore with great patience the objects of his wrath prepared for destruction? What if he did this to make the riches of his glory known to the objects of his mercy, whom he prepared in advance for glory, even us, whom he also called not only from the Jews, but also from the Gentiles. As he says in Hosea, I will call them my people who are not my people, and I will call her my loved one who is not my loved one. And in the very place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they will be called children of the living God. Here in Romans 9, in this great discussion of election and predestination and, and mercy, and I won't go into all the details, but Paul just trying to answer the question, how is it that Israel, the chosen people of God, are not experiencing salvation? Paul writes, for now, for a time, God has blinded them so that he can call many from the Gentiles. And in calling many from the Gentiles, and some from the Jews as well, he will fulfill this promise from Hosea. Those who were not my people will be called my people. Israel is divorced. They're put away. But eventually, God will restore them. And in restoring them, he enlarges and expands our understanding of what it means to be the people of God by adding many Gentiles to that company. So many that you can't even number them. They're greater than the sands of the seashore, which ironically fulfills what? The original promise made to Abraham. So God is merciful to his people, to the very people who sinned against them. He cast them away for a time so that he might bring even more in and in doing so restore his people and save them by his grace. And so in the last few minutes tonight, let me just touch quickly on chapters two and three, where these themes of judgment and restoration are repeated using, lastly, once again, the imagery of a marriage. In chapter 2, it's the imagery, sadly, of a divorce trial. Look at chapter 2, the beginning of verse 2. Hosea says, rebuke your mother, rebuke her, for she is not my wife and I am not her husband. Verse 4, I will not show my love to her children because they are the children of adultery. One author writes, the literary form in chapter 2 is a prophetic covenant lawsuit. In other words, the prophet is going to act out, use language that connects to a divorce trial. And in doing so, the prophet puts God in several roles. He's the plaintiff, he's the prosecutor, he's the judge, and he's the jailer. He summons Israel, the defendant, into court. He presents evidence of her crimes. He finds her guilty and pronounces a judgment sentence and announces Israel's future as a convicted covenant breaker. Israel 
cheated on God. And now she has been put away. Her guilt has been proved and the divorce has been finalized. And yet again, despite that verdict, restoration comes. Look at verses 14 through 16 of chapter 2. Therefore, I am now going to allure her. I will lead her into the wilderness and speak tenderly to her. There I will give her back her vineyards and will make the valley of Achor a door of hope. There she will respond as in the days of her youth, as in the day she came up out of Egypt. In that day, declares the Lord, you will call me my husband. You will no longer call me my master. It's almost a contradiction. God walks out of the courtroom and begins to court and woo this person. He's just divorced because that's how great his love is. That the divorce is only temporary in order to show his just judgment, which did come, but mercy in order to continue his redemptive plan towards people that don't deserve them. Even notice the imagery there, verse 15. I'll make the valley of Achor a door of hope. Do you remember the valley of Achor? It's from the story about Achan when he stole the loot from Jericho that was on the band. And he eventually got caught. He and his family were stoned. They were stoned in the valley of Achor. So it's a place that calls to mind judgment, bad things happening. And yet God says, I'll take that place where judgment was handed out. And I'll make that a door of hope. That's how our God works. He's in the business of changing judgment into restoration and restoring bad things from the past. Verse 20, I will betroth you in faithfulness and you will acknowledge the Lord Verse 23, I will plant her for myself in the land. I will show my love to the one I called not my loved one. I will say to those called not my people, you are my people, and they will say you are my God. And that brings us into the last observations of chapter 3. Not only does the Lord pursue this people in order to restore her, he turns her to himself. Notice that. He says, I'll call you my people, and you'll say you are my God. I'll fix the problem that led to the alienation and the divorce in the first place. And so that's why chapter 3 gives us one more marriage story. Hosea reobtains his wife. Chapter 3, verse 1, the Lord said to me, go, show your love to your wife again. Though she is loved by another man and is an adulteress, love her as the Lord loves the Israelites, though they turn to other gods and love the sacred raisin cakes. Apparently, she left him, and he woos her back. He goes and reobtains his wife. Verse 2 speaks of a dowry. So I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and about a homer and a lethek of barley. Whether there was some kind of crime committed or a divorce then has to be fixed through the paying of this dowry, Hosea does what he has to do in order to regain his wife and actually puts money forward in order to show the value with which he views her, that he loves her. This language can be offensive, you know, putting a price on marriage as if women were property and treating them as something uh, to be bartered. I think it's ironic that in our society, uh, women are still treated that way, though those who do that don't even want to put forward anything to show their commitment. Which culture is really the barbaric backwards one? Hosea puts forth this money in order to show that this woman has value and he loves her and she's worth giving something up for in order to re-obtain her. And thus, verse 3, his marriage, his love transforms her. Then I told her, you are to live with me many days. You must not be a prostitute or be intimate with any man and I will behave the same way toward you. In other words, the restoring love will change this person. And such love pictures the gospel. We are the unfaithful spouse. We are the ones who sin against God. And he, in his mercy, seeks us out and saves us. He pays the price, gives his own life, in order to obtain us as his people and his love transforms. So take hope. You are loved by God. You are worth the price of his own life. Take hope. His love transforms you. Take hope that the love shown here uh, in this marriage is not only a picture of our relationship with the Lord, but gives us guidance in our own marriages to show love and forgiveness and patience and restoration. And beyond that, outside of marriage, 
to our own relationships, that we are a people of patience, that we are a people of mercy, that we are a people who aim for restoration and who give glory to God. This is obviously being the, the, the prime, preeminent myth, uh, picture. Glory to God of a loving, saving, restoring Savior. So let's give him our thanks this evening. Father in heaven, thank you for loving us. And we take a moment even now to reflect on times when we sin against you, when we sin against others, and it is heinous. Maybe it was a life lived in rebellion or spiritual indolence before you saved us. Perhaps we were raised as believers, raised as Christians, taught the gospel from a young age, yet we still know our sin. Perhaps there was a period of later wandering or falling away, and you restored us, God. We thank you for mercy. Thank you for your incredible patience with us. Thank you for your love for your church, that you gave yourself in order to obtain your bride and to sanctify her and to cleanse her. So be at work in us tonight. Make us more holy, God. Forgive us of our sins. Make us more holy. Increase our love for you. Help us to be zealous to keep the terms of the covenant, to believe in you alone for our righteousness, to love and serve you alone as our God. And may this covenant community know your blessing on this assembly. Forgive us of our sins against you. Be pleased to show mercy to the robot church. Great. Grant that each person here would know you and would seek you. And that this would be an assembly where you are loved and worshipped and where you bless your people for your name's sake. We give you our thanks for these things. Pray you would bless us as we go into the coming week. Whatever it is that you have given us to do, whatever calling, whatever jobs, whatever blessings, or whatever trials. Uh, may we know your love and care and protection in the coming days. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We go now with God's blessing, friend. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.